Good morning, Grace Christian Church. It's good to be together, despite the fact that we are apart. In these days, we are fortunate to have this technology to worship together, to study God's word together, to connect with one another virtually. So please uh, stay at the end of our service, spend some time speaking with others in breakout groups and reminding each other what we look like and uh, encouraging one another, maybe even praying for one another in some of those breakout groups if you choose to, but maybe just to chat and have a few minutes of conversation. Thank you to everyone that's uh, participated in this service up to this point. We have lots of people who are willing to help with our hosting and our readings and our songs and uh, thank you that we can do this together. I also want to thank our vision team who have uh, who are part of the transition team and they've been working on a vision survey for the last little while. I want to encourage you to prayerfully fill out that vision survey that is available through a link in our announcements and uh, encourage you to think about what uh, your what the future of our church looks like to you. Uh, this will help us all as we think about where God might be calling this congregation into the future. What is it that we might uniquely be able to do in Winnipeg that perhaps no other church in the city can do? So think about those things, pray about those things, fill out the survey. That'll be very helpful as we get towards that point of beginning to uh, look for a lead pastor for our congregation. That will help us as we put together the uh, documents that we will share with a potential lead pastor. Thank you to Donna Riddell for reading our Luke passage. You will recognize this passage as continuing on from the passage that we looked at last week. And uh, you'll recall that last week as we studied this passage, Jesus had spoken in the synagogue. He had preached in the synagogue, read the passage from Isaiah chapter 60, and talked about the, the fulfillment of the promises of that passage in Isaiah. Uh, a longer passage that has to do with the new era, uh, days of jubilee, uh, the kingdom of God in the future, and that sort of thing that uh, Isaiah was prophesying about. And Jesus is saying, the, these are the days in which we now live, much like we just sang about days of Elijah, days of jubilee. We are now in that era of when the good news will be preached to the poor, uh, those who are oppressed will be released from their oppression, those who are in chains will be freed, those sorts of things that Jesus spoke of last time. So let's walk through this passage together. And I'll, in this slightly more relaxed mode here today, uh, let me just say that we'll kind of guide this like it was a Bible study together. So we're going to look through the passage together, then make some practical applications at the end. So let's just seek to understand this passage together grow from it, and then uh, decide how we will live by it as we uh, continue on in, in our world this day. Let me start with a word of prayer. God, open our eyes, open our hearts. Lord Jesus, we are here to serve your purposes in the world. Holy Spirit, come upon our hearts so that we might know your will for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll notice in this passage today that uh, after Jesus spoke about this scripture and said it was fulfilled this very day, everyone spoke well of him. Uh, they were amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. But then they start asking questions. Isn't this Joseph's son? It's like they begin to ask a few words, a few questions about his credentials. Uh, Joseph was a carpenter, right? Uh, yeah, Jesus grew up here in Nazareth. Uh, is Jesus a carpenter? Is he, did he get trained somewhere? How is he able to say these things here in our presence? Did he go to one of the best universities? Does he have a PhD? 
well, surely he must have a master's degree in theology, maybe from some place like Regent Seminary. They begin to ask questions about his credentials. Who is this man? Jesus uh, didn't have the credentials they were expecting him to have. Then Jesus says to them, because he knows what they're thinking, and he knows what they're asking each other and asking in their minds. You will undoubtedly quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Meaning, do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. So they're asking for credentials. They're also asking, well, maybe you could prove to us who you are with a small miracle. Just a small one, Jesus. Maybe you could prove to us who you are. Give us a miracle like you've given in other places. Jesus says, well, I got some news for you. No prophet is honored in his own hometown or accepted in his own hometown. And then he goes on to say, I want you to remember something. In the days of Elijah, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and there was a severe famine in the land of Israel, Elijah was not sent to any of the widows who were suffering from famine in Israel. Elijah was sent to a foreigner, a woman in Sidon. Hmm, that's thought-provoking. And then he says, I want you to remember that in Israel, there were many who had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, or Elisha, as he's sometimes referred to. But the only one that was healed by Elisha was Naaman, a Syrian. Now they begin to put two and two together here. They begin to think this through. And like our speaking of life pastor uh, spoke of today, it begins to hit a little close to home, doesn't it? And so we begin, they begin to ask more questions and begin to get a little bit angry. And they begin to say, well, you're not going to give us a miracle? Others in Capernaum and other places get miracles, but we don't get a miracle? Where's our miracle? We want a miracle. But Jesus says, no, today is not about you. Today I want you to understand that This year of Jubilee is for everyone, including the Gentiles, including those in Capernaum, including those in on the other side of the world. This is a day of the kingdom of God coming for all people. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him, forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him off a cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on their way. I want you to just think on those last few words for a minute. He passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Think about how that might have happened. We'll come back to that in a a little while. See, this passage is, tells us that not everyone always accepted who Jesus was. They would ask questions. They would wonder if he was truly who he said he was. They asked, why do others get miracles when we don't get miracles? Have you ever asked that yourself? I know it's something we all ask. It's something I often ask in my prayers. I've seen many miracles in my day, but I still ask the question sometimes, why do I see others getting miracles, but Maybe I'm not getting miracles, or maybe those I'm praying for are not getting miracles. That's my most common prayer. Why, when we pray for this individual, are we not seeing that miraculous recovery? Those sorts of things. And sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. But here we can relate to what the people of Nazareth are asking. We ask this, this question many times about our prayers. I ask it many times in words I write. Jesus says there were many widows in Israel and only the foreign woman in Sidon got a miracle. 
There were many who had leprosy, but only Naaman got a miracle. There are some who will get miracles. There are some who will not. We tend to say, why? Why them, not me? Or we sometimes say, why, why me and not them? We compare. We look to the other person. We lament. <clears throat> it makes me think of that interaction between Peter and Jesus in one of the post-resurrection appearances. Jesus comes to Peter and says, feed my lambs. And he says it quite strongly three times. Peter says, well, wait a minute. What about John over there? Shouldn't you be telling him the same thing? Jesus says, what about John? You worry about Peter. <laughs> it kind of feels the way Jesus speaks to me sometimes. Don't worry about what others are doing. You worry about you, Keith. You follow me as, as I'm calling you to follow me. Here in Nazareth, Jesus is saying that God showed his love to the widow in Sidon and the military leader with leprosy. The people of Nazareth were saying, wait, doesn't God love us? But Jesus is not speaking of them at this moment. Of course God loves the Jewish people. Of course he does. But Jesus is speaking about other things right now. He's telling them that God loves the Gentiles as well. This feels unjust to them. They want to say, come on, Jesus, how long have we been God's people? God's been taking care of us because we worship him in our temple and in our synagogues. This isn't fair. <clears throat> Pardon me. This isn't fair that God shows love to the Gentiles. Don't be preaching that stuff around here. God looks after us because we are his people. Don't tell us others might get miracles and we might not. This is shocking and unjust to them. It seems that way anyway. There's a very quick change of attitude here, isn't there? They went from speaking well of Jesus and being amazed at his words to furious with him in just a few minutes. They mob him and they're about to push him off a cliff. It's like they're saying, if we can't have miracles, then nobody's going to have miracles. We're going to push this miracle worker off the cliff. You see, people like to be reminded that God loves them. They're not as keen about remembering that God loves other people, and especially people that they don't particularly like. They may be realizing that the year of Jubilee, the era of Jubilee, will also mean that they need to give to others and give to those that they don't even like. Jesus could have soothed the crowd here, I'm sure. He could have said, oh, don't worry. God still loves you. You are still his favorites. But he doesn't soften the blow, does he? He wants them to hear that God loves and provides miracles for the Gentiles and sometimes not for the people of Israel. He wants them to understand that the kingdom of God is for everyone and that they are to give grace to all. I think he wants them to stew over this a little bit for a while. It makes them angry. It makes them mad at Jesus. And what is anger? Well, anger management courses will tell you that a common root of anger is fear. When we fear that we will lose our place, when we fear that we are not special, when we fear that we're not getting a miracle and somebody else is, we can easily become angry. A man by the name, uh, a journalist by the name of Peter Dunn once spoke of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. Well, here Jesus is certainly afflicting the comfortable. He pushes them to see that they are not the only ones loved by God. God's grace, his miracles, his love extend to all people. People are mad. They're ready to throw him off a cliff. Now, how does Jesus get out of this difficult spot? Is it a miraculous getaway, or did he just happen to walk through the crowd? Some would say it wasn't really a miracle. He just, he just walked through the crowd. Well, I, I just can't help but see this as a miraculous getaway. I think Jesus did get away from his tormentors on this moment and get away from dying on a cliff in Nazareth. 
by walking through the crowd just like he walked through walls and through <clears throat> and ended up in locked rooms after his resurrection you see i i don't buy it that he just went hey look over there and everybody looked over there and then he scampered off this way that doesn't seem like the jesus that we would expect <clears throat> I think he probably walked miraculously out of this situation. And if he did, here is the irony. They ask for a miracle. He does not give them a miracle in Nazareth like they're asking for. They get angry and they threaten his life. And he gives them a miracle. But most of them will probably not see the miracle. They didn't realize he had given them a miracle. He walked through the crowd miraculously and they didn't see it. <clears throat> well, I think there's an irony there. You can decide for yourself how you think God uh, helped Jesus get out of that situation. But more importantly today, I think we need to look at this passage and say, what is it that the Holy Spirit has for us today here at Grace Christian Church? What is the message for us in our church as a community in our lives individually. The Holy Spirit is a clear communicator, much clearer than this preacher is. The Holy Spirit has a message from this passage for us today. It's up to us to see what it is. And just like Jesus' words to the people in Nazareth, it may sometimes afflict our comfort, or it may hit a little too close to home. Certainly part of the message out of this today is that it is not all about me. It's not all about you. It's not all about us. <clears throat> when we see that God gives miracles, we might say, we, and we might even ask, God, could you give me that miracle today? And God might say to us, uh, no, today is, is not about you. I have some other people who I'm going to give a miracle to today. We say sometimes, why am I sick when others are healthy? Why am I poor when others are rich? Why is my church small when other churches are large? Why am I stuck in a place when others are traveling the world? And God says to us, yes, I'll give you my grace, my love, my miracles. But the miracle you might be asking for today, you're not going to get today. Even now, I'm tempted to soften the blow with you and, and bring comfort in this message. But I think our Father wants us to sit with these questions for a while. Sometimes the miracles might go to others. Now, of course, the key take-home message for us is God does indeed love everyone. Jesus wants the kingdom of God to come in each and every person's life. If Jesus is our role model though if Jesus is our role model of what love looks like then our love and his love ought to both look like sacrificial love our Lord is one person of the Holy Trinity of God he was there at the creation of the universe and as C.S. Lewis describes in his book the four loves the Holy Trinity together created the universe out of love for us. C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Four Loves, he said, God, who needs nothing, loves into existence holy, superfluous creatures in order that he may love and perfect them. He didn't need us, but he chose to make us so that he might love us and make his love perfect in us. He creates the universe already foreseeing the buzzing cloud of flies around the cross. The flayed back pressed against the cross. The nails driven into the mesial nerves. The suffocation of crucifixion. The repeated torture of crucifixion. C.S. Lewis says, if I may dare the biological image, God is a host who deliberately creates his own parasites, causes us to be that way so that, and that we might exploit him and take advantage of him. 
Herein is love. The diagram of love himself, the inventor of all loves, says, I will create these creatures for love, even though they may reject me. I was able to tune into a Philip Yancey lecture yesterday, and he, had it, he said it this way. He says, the God of the universe, the God who sees further than the James Webb telescope, which we may have heard about in the news these days, chose to become one of these tiny little creatures that walks around on two legs on the tiny planet Earth. That kind of puts it in perspective for us, doesn't it? Our Heavenly Father, the great three-in-one, made a plan a long time ago. He already knew how it would turn out. God didn't need to create the universe or create humanity. He already had the community of the Trinity. But he wanted to share the love and community of the Trinity. And so he created. He knew that these humans he was creating would rebel against him, take advantage of his grace and love. Still, he chose to create he knew that many would do evil, yet he chose to create and love all. He's very gracious with his love and will go to great lengths to save as many as possible. His love will keep pursuing even the worst offender, even the people we don't like. So practically, what do we do with this message that the Holy Spirit is giving to us today? I want to suggest to you an exercise for all of us to do. This week, take some time to go somewhere, either in reality <laughs> or virtually. Look at a room full of, full of people. Maybe it'll be a room full of people at a coffee shop, but maybe it'll be a room full of people on a Zoom call. And one by one, look at each person and think of each person in your mind and say, Jesus loves Joe. Jesus loves that person, and I don't know their name. Jesus loves that person who's a little bit smelly and hasn't had a bath for a long time. Jesus loves that person who has problems in their life. Jesus loves that person who is wealthy. Jesus loves that person who is poor. Jesus wants to give good things and wants to give the kingdom to everyone. Try to leave yourself out of it for a minute. But think about how Jesus loves each person in that room. That they're all invited into the kingdom of God. And then think about how you might pray for those individuals. Think about how God may have a miracle for them. And in fact, the miracle that we might be asking for might be going to them right now. Tough things to think about, and yet these, I believe, are the words of God's Holy Spirit for us today. Maybe we can even pray and say, God, I know that person needs a miracle. Could you give them today the miracle that you might have otherwise given to me? Can we think like that? The God of Jubilee, the God of celebration, the God of grace wants to give his grace to all. Amen. Amen.